Just look at these beautiful poppies. I think these are the blue Euro poppies. I was a little concerned because they were so short, but I think they're delicate and lovely. And back there, little pink ones. And then we have some. This is wonderful. It's poppies this morning, all different sizes. It happens every spring, usually in mid May. I come outside in the morning, and the air is absolutely filled with the sweet scent of wild roses. You know immediately once they start opening because their scent absolutely fills the air. No matter what part of the property you go on, you can smell these wonderful roses. I don't think any rose smells as good as this one. And all these wild roses were from one tiny plant that I dug up out of the woods about oh, 15 years ago. And now they are just everywhere. My protege has been taken over by pink primrose and little ducks. So these are my little ducklings. And this poor little duckling has a little wonky leg. She's got some kind of problem with her walking. She can walk, but she's very bow-legged. She can look at, look at how big they are already. I'm letting them stay in the potage where they can be safe for now because they're, they don't have any mommy to take care of them except me. So I'm trying to keep a close eye on them. And uh, they've got their little swimming pool over here. For now. <laughs> But 
You're adorable. My gosh, they grow fast. Hello, Winston. I hope I have two girls and a boy. So I'd have a Pity Pat, a Winston, and a Mia. I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about up planting your young plants that you started from seed in pots. If you don't plan on putting your young plants directly into your garden because maybe you haven't prepared your garden bed yet or you just don't know where you want to put them and when they get about this size these are there are three hollyhocks in here I could easily put these in the garden right now the problem is I'm not quite sure where I want to put them yet but they are outgrowing these peat pellets so what I want to do is I want to up pot them into something larger so that they can grow even bigger and stronger so I'm going to take the entire pellet. This is one thing I love about these pellets is you just can take this whole thing and put it right in another pot. In this case I want to split them apart though so let's take one that's just a little bit a single and there it is. I've got a much bigger pot here. This has got potting soil in it. I'm going to make a space for it and I'm just going to pop it in and now it has a lot more room to grow it's going to be a lot healthier and stronger when I do decide to put it into the garden. And let me just show you a few examples of different things that didn't get up potted as opposed to those that did. This is why it comes in handy to save all those little plastic pots if you've bought bedding plants in the, in the past and just keep them because you, you really can use them later on. Now here's another example. This is Asian spinach, which I took a long time transplanting into a bigger pot. because so I want to put this in several different gardens, and I've already put it in the potager, but I want to put it in the colonial garden too. But I took my time in putting this in a little pot, but this one I put into a larger pot right away. Look at the difference in their growth. Huge. Same, same uh, soil, everything. But this one I transplanted into the larger pot earlier than this one. So this is just something um, that it's important to do and then all these little little things here I'm just surrounded today with all sorts of plants that need to be moved. As you can see all kinds of things need to be either put into the garden or just given a bigger growing space. Here are some straw flowers that I planted from seed in these peat, pellet, peat pellets. And you can see they're getting pretty lanky and they're actually ready to put into the ground, which is where these are going. But before I knew where I was going to put them, I took half of those, put them in a larger tray with a lot more room. Look at the difference in size. So if you just give them room to grow, they'll do a lot better if you're not ready to plant them into the ground yet. Today's antique flowers are Canterbury Bells and Sweet Peas. Unfortunately, I could not find a lot of photographs with Canterbury Bells, and I did not have any video from my garden because I only had two successful plants last year. But they belong to the Campanula family, which would include the bellflowers, the cup and saucer Canterbury Bells, and the ordinary, well, not so ordinary, Canterbury Bells, that you can see right here. They, um, the meaning of Campanula is Tower of Bells in Latin, and they are native to Southern Europe, and they were introduced to British gardeners in 1597, and they initially were called Coventry Bells until the 1800s, also known as Venus Looking Glass. They are a biennial, which means, once again, they bloom the second year. So we're going to be planting ours in little pots and keeping a very close eye on them. And as they grow and get larger, we probably won't even put them in the garden until the end of summer. And then, next year, in the garden, they shall bloom, we hope, in these marvelous, lush, and vibrant colors. Just look at that. So let's get planting on these Canterbury Bell seeds. You could just as easily plant these directly in the garden, but because I want to really keep an eye on them, 
sometimes that's the best way for me to have a successful plant is to start it in a pot and really take good care of it instead of letting it get lost somewhere in the garden where I forget all about it and it dries out and I never see it again. So this is the reason I start a lot of these things in pots. So we're going to do our Canterbury Bells, several different kind, and we're going to do the Canterbury Bells, we're going to do the cup and saucer mix. This one I'm a little concerned about because it's, mm, this package of seeds is two years old, it may not be any good, but we'll find out. And then we're going to do some bell flowers, and these are all in the Campanula family. So let's start out with our beautiful little Canterbury Bells. And I'm using the clay pots today. I want to um, have a nice deep pot in this case because I am going to keep them in the pots for quite a while before I put them in the garden. And one thing to keep in mind with clay pots is they dry out a lot more easily than the plastic. So it's good to put them in a, on a tray where you can keep them watered from the bottom or have a little dishes that come with them. You really want to keep an eye on clay pots when you plant anything in them. They really do dry out pretty quickly. If you're going to sow these directly in the garden, you're going to want to sow them in late summer or early fall and you'll get blooms the following year. But since it's early spring and I'm planting them in pots, oh by the way this is a very good plant to grow in pots and just keep them in pots. Um, I'm going to let them grow to a pretty decent size and then I'll probably up pot them again and then I won't plant them into the garden until probably late summer and then they will bloom hopefully the following year because this is a biennial doesn't bloom the first year just grows a lot of foliage and then after that the next year then you've got your wonderful flowers hopefully and a lot of seed. So once again you can see that we have a very tiny seed here. Not as small as the foxglove, but I'll probably sprinkle a, about, I don't know, eight to ten seeds in each little pot and thin them out um, accordingly. Keep your pots nice and wet. And don't really put them out in the, give them some light, but don't really put them out in the hot sun at this point. Now the germination rate on the Campanula and the Canterbury Bells in particular, 14 to 21 days, so you have to be patient. In fact, these just started appearing and it's been about two weeks since I put these seeds in the pots. But um, you can see that we're finally getting some wee babies. So really, it's worth the wait. The sweet pea was a wildflower growing in Sicily, which was transported to England in 1699. Sweet peas were not considered great beauties at the time, but they did possess an exquisite fragrance. In fact, the flowers only grew two to a stem, and they came in only two colors, maroon and blue. with tall spikes of flowers and curling tendrils and delicate, lovely, luxurious little blooms. These spikes of sweet peas had a scent that was compared to honey and oranges. So that's no wonder that they actually caught on quite big with the public in the 1850s. And by the 1900s, there was not a dinner table setting or a wedding in England or America that was not complete without a bouquet of sweet peas. It was actually very rare to see a garden without sweet peas climbing a fence or a trellis. And in this case, I've got these getting ready to climb a trellis, we hope. So, mixed in with these sweet peas, we have nasturtiums. And these have been growing or I guess, I think I put them in, in April. Nowadays, sweet peas come in a variety 
of rich colors. And I do wish I had some footage to show you of my sweet peas, but since I've never had any luck with them so far, I'm trying again. So I am just showing you a photograph from a garden book with some beautiful sweet peas. Now they like a sunny location and a nice rich soil and plenty of moisture. So I think they're going to be re really great in this particular pot in the middle of the colonial garden where first the tulips bloomed and now we have the sweet peas and the nasturtiums growing side by side. Now I use this old cattle trough for a nursery bed where I experiment with a lot of different kinds of flowers. So I put sweet peas here along the back in the hopes that they will climb up this chicken wire and travel up the trellis and just cover this up all the way to the top with their beautiful blooms and scent. And so far so good. Um, I did have to treat these for aphids the other day with neem because they were absolutely covered with aphids. I'm just glad that I caught them on time. But one thing I do know is that once your sweet peas get oh, about this tall, you want to pinch the tops off. And the reason being, once you pinch the tops off, they're going to get fuller on the bottom. You see this one? See all these different stems and branches coming out? Now, otherwise it would just go straight up instead of producing all this extra foliage, which you're going to need to twine all around the chicken wire or your string. It's growing also in this garden trough, nursery bed, are snapdragons. And I am just going to leave them in here. And the way I look at it is, if the sweet peas and the snapdragons are successful, that'll be a wonderful little cutting garden that I have right here, right outside our back door. So I'm not transplanting any of these. They're all going to stay in here. Oh, with the exception of these little foxglove seeds, which are coming up pretty nicely. Those will be going into the garden. So it's great to have a garden trough like this, where you can really keep an eye on your plants and basically experiment with all sorts of different things. Now I chose this mammoth sweet pea because it's a native wildflower for our region, which is south east. Uh, we're in East Tennessee, but I also chose it because this one should be a lot more heat tolerant than most sweet peas. It goes 60 inches tall, plant 0.1 inches deep, and it is an annual of course, so you know that it is not going to return, and so it does all its blooming in one season, which is why they're supposed to be so prolific and wonderful. Now I've never tried these before, but they're supposed to be large ruffled blooms, in pink, red, blue, lilac, and white, and heat resistance, and also these are old peas, and so they do have a very sweet, sweet perfume. So I'm going to try my luck again with peas. I think they'll be better this year than they were last year. I really, mm, I don't know, last year they just were not very successful, but I don't think I had them in the right spot. So this year, we'll see. I hope you'll give sweet peas a try and let me know how you do with them. The sweet peas, as you can see, are quite different from garden peas. And keep in mind that you cannot eat any part of a sweet pea. It is toxic, the leaves, the flowers, the stems, and the pods, they are not to be eaten. And the little peas are much smaller than garden peas, as you can see. To plant. Now here you can clearly see the difference between garden peas and sweet peas. Well, you can certainly tell by the price of this seed packet that this is a vintage packet for sweet peas. But I would say that the directions are pretty much the same as they are now, where climate will permit seed may be planted any time from late summer to early winter for early spring flowering. Spring planting may be made at any time when weather and soil conditions will permit. They thrive and bloom in a variety of soils, but prefer a moderately rich and thoroughly manured and cultivated soil. And they like an eastern or southern exposure. And here you have a beautiful wall of sweet peas in an English garden. And you can see that our colors now are not relegated to just blues and maroons, but we have some pretty vibrant colors for sweet peas. Now, according to the Victorian Meaning of Flowers book, sweet peas stand for lasting pleasure, and that's because of their continuous 
summer bloom. And here you can see some beautiful continuous bloom in the gardens of Tasha Tudor. And this is a photograph from one of her books. I love the reds, the purples, and the pinks together. Oh, and here she is again with an armload of sweet peas. Wouldn't that be great? I hope I can get an armload of sweet peas this year. So you've been gardening all day, you want a nice quick lunch, you don't want to go in and clean up and shake off all the dirt and the mud and take off your shoes and all that jazz. So you open up your lunch box or you pull it pasty right out of your pocket. In this case I went ahead and wrapped this one in aluminum foil to keep it nice and hot and I can feel that it is still nice and warm. And I just have a thermos of coffee here. This could be tea or lemonade or anything else that you want to drink. I need an extra boost in the afternoon, so I generally will drink coffee. So I became interested in pasties because of Hercule Poirot, uh, Agatha Christie's Poirot with David Suchet, because Chief Inspector Jap was always pulling this yummy looking crusty pastry covered thing out of his pocket or stopping at a food vendor on the on the street and buying one of these yummy looking things, which I did not know what they were, being an American and all, but it turns out it was a pasty. So supposedly the origin of the pasty was the Cornish pasty, a traditional Cornish pasty, which was a food that the miners would take down in the mines with them in Cornwall. And this was a nice portable meal full of meat, potatoes and onions and generally a turnip and then some sort of nice gravy and that would be a traditional Cornish pasty with a nice thick crust although also flaky and yummy but it was said that it should be hard enough that if it fell down the mine shaft it wouldn't break 
so <laughs> I don't know if mine's that hard, but it's pretty hard. And that's one of the reasons that when you're doing the pastry crust, you need it a lot more than you would a pie crust because you want it to be a little bit more sturdy to hold everything that's inside of it. Now mine is filled with beef stew because we had leftover beef stew and I wanted to have the carrots in it. Uh, apparently a, a Cornish pasty would not have carrots in it, but this is just a pasty. And I think it broke in half when I was, so this, yeah, it did break in half when I was rewrapping it. And of course this one would not fall down a mine shaft without breaking because it already has broken in half. But you can see the meat in there. It looks so delicious and it really is. It really is. My tr th a crust is really thick. I really need to work on my crust. And honestly, if I think if I was going to make this again, I would buy uh, one of the paste puff pastries because that is one of the crusts I tried first and it just completely fell apart, but it was handmade. I would purchase a puff pastry crust, which is pretty thick, and that's what I would wrap my next pasty in that I make. But I think that even though this is a pretty thick crust, it looks more like a biscuit really, um, it's really quite good. And I'm definitely going to make these again, but you could put anything you want in a pasty. You could use um, chicken, fish, or you know, whatever, whatever, whatever kind of filling you like. So this is a great lunch to stick in your pocket if you want to. This is a pocket garden lunch. And in my case, I wanted to use my old lunch box here. This is the lunch box that I had from the time I was seven years old. And I had to take this to school with me. To, frankly, I think by the time I was in fifth or sixth grade, I, I just hated it. But... <laughs> um, and this isn't the original one. This is one I found at an antique store, just like mine. And so I had to, I had to have it. Nostalgia. I think these were made in the 19, I think this was made in 1950. So traditional little lunchbox, or like I said, you can stick that pasty right in your pocket if it's tough enough, but maybe you don't want all that garden soil all over your pasty. So wrap it up tight, keep it nice and hot, and enjoy a pasty this week after you get out of your garden. So from here in Hopalong Hollow, I hope you will enjoy a garden pocket lunch in the form of a pasty. I hope you will decide to plant some of those sweet peas and Canterbury bells in your garden. And I just wanted to give you a parting shot of this absolutely stunning and exquisite peony growing in one of the gardens. These are so fleeting. <laughs> and especially after rain, those petals start to droop and drop. But I had to give a shot of this. And it is absolutely huge. And gorgeous. And as usual, I cannot remember the name of it. But from Hopalong Hollow, this is Jerry, and I'll see you next time. Bye.